Well, welcome tonight. Glad you're out. And uh, we're excited to have Dan Biddle. He was here two years ago. And uh, we appreciate him so much. Got to talking with him, and he's from down in uh, Sacramento area. Folsom. Okay, Folsom. Uh, if you have one of these, if you could turn it off, that would help us. Okay, so, or mute it. Okay, so I've been asked to tell you that. Uh, but uh, Dan Biddle is, uh, well, let's pray first. Okay, let's start off with prayer. Thank you, Father, for the time we can have together uh, to learn your word, to learn about creation. Thank you for Shasta Bible College and their uh, work with us and churches around to get the word out about your word and about your creation and to encourage us and to inform us. Help us, Father, to be able to learn tonight. Help us to be able to apply what we learn. Uh, give uh, Dan a special uh, uh, ability as he uh, shares with us what's on his heart and shares with us what he's learned at his ministry with this uh, ministry to youth pastors and pastors and parents and students. Bless our time together and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, uh, By way of announcement, we have an offering plate in the back. Uh, you can put your offering in there. Uh, we'll just put it in an envelope. It all goes to Shasta Bible College. Okay? Uh, for the speakers and for uh, the conference. Okay? So... Uh, Dan Biddle, like I said, he's founder and president of Genesis Apologetics. It's uh, Northern California's largest creation ministry, and it's dedicated to equipping pastors, youth pastors, parents, and students with biblical answers to evolutionary teaching in public schools. And uh, of course, he comes to local churches, uh, other churches, but we're excited to have him tonight and he's going to come and share with us what God lays on his heart. So, Dan. How is everyone doing tonight? I think I'm double mic, so I might be blasting you right now with, with uh, is the sound okay? Okay, terrific. Well, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, Who's seen some of my other talks about dinosaurs and Noah's flood? Okay, great. This is going to be a whole different topic. I, I had some overlap on the other ones, which I think was quite necessary because it's hard to talk about the dinosaurs without bringing up the flood and vice versa. But tonight we're just talking about the number one reason that people believe in evolution. We did a survey um, a few years ago of 600 people who were exiting Amazon they were, uh, through a company called Polster. So you check out of Amazon, then a flash comes up on your screen and says, hey, we'll pay you 10 bucks to do a survey. We hired about 600 of those people as survey participants, and we asked them just two questions. Regardless of your religious background, what's the number one evidence you find most convincing for evolution? And the second question was, what's the second most convincing evidence you have for evolution. And we took all those summaries of responses and analyzed them every possible way you could. And we learned something very important because we wanted to be able to target our ministry towards debunking the, the fabric or the knowledge network, if you will, of why people were believing in evolution. And it all came down to four topics. And, and human evolution was the number one topic. Students nowadays are just steeped in the idea of the whole march of progress you know, icon that we see where we go from chimps and then the icons are gradually standing up all the way to, to, to humans. The second reason was Darwin's theory proper and then the third was fossils in transition and the fourth was just because scientists believe it. They thought that was a very, very compelling reason. So, but tonight we're gonna to be focusing on the, on the number one reason that people believe in evolution and as a, as a behavioral scientist, I've spent about 20 years testifying as an expert in state and federal court cases dealing with statistics and research. So I guess it's all right to say I have a pretty good understanding of evidence and the observational scientific method and what makes a good case and what doesn't. 
And I can stand here and agree with evolutionists that have said the same thing, that if you were to sum all the evidence for, for we have for human evolution and try to admit it into court, it would be dead on the doorstep. It couldn't, couldn't go anywhere. It's the weakest link, the weakest theory evolutionists have. There, it's a mystery how humans came here. And in fact, if you, if you were to take the whole sum of evidence that we have that we evolved from ape-like creatures based on the fossil, the fossil record, you could put the really good stuff into a Home Depot bucket, they would say, and then maybe a, maybe a wheelbarrow for some of the more convincing stuff. But if you took the whole of it, all the evidence they have from all the museums of these early hominid-type fossils, you could put them all into the back of a pickup truck. And I didn't knew that go, know, know that going through, through school. They make it appear like, oh my gosh, you've got all kinds of these creatures and they're pulling them up out of the earth all the time. But that's really not the case. It's a very unsubstantiated theory of evolution. So with that brief background, we'll, we'll dig right in here. Our ministry has four different divisions. The first is that we spend a lot of time strengthening Christian schools. Uh, Dave Bisbee, our vice president, spends a lot of time in K-8 schools. I do some high schools and some colleges, but it's fair to say we're probably given 12 or 15 talks or conferences every year in the Northern California region uh, in Christian schools. Uh, we give a lot of local church presentations. Before COVID, we were probably doing 30 to 50 talks a year. We have an annual conference called the G1 Conference, where we have about six hours of teaching. We just gave it a couple weeks ago. Went out to about 30,000 people uh, worldwide, different countries and everything. We partnered with ICR, Answers in Genesis and CMI, to put that on. And it's really thick, academic, heady teaching. Uh, but I think it's important. You know, we didn't intersperse it with humor or music or worship or anything. It's just very dry talking heads. But if you want the information, uh, it's there. And I think our largest or our widest outreach is social media. We're one of the top uh, content providers on social media on the creation topic. We have over 100 videos in our library. And so we have about 111,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube and about 10 million views. And on Facebook, we have over 30,000 followers there. If you have a K-8 student or grad student at home, please go to our main website, just Genesis Apologetics, and click on the K-8 Student Zone. Uh, Dave, our vice president, has taken part of his house, converted it to a studio, and he's preparing 72 different episodes four K through eight graders that are designed for, I think he breaks it up K to two, three to five, and six to eight. And he's got 24 different topics he's doing for all those different age categories, and it's all free. For fifth to 10th graders, we have a program called debunkevolution.com. If you have a kid in public school, great idea to put them through that program because it teaches them, here's what you're gonna learn in school and here's why it's limited scientifically and here's what the Bible says about creation. And then before a high schooler goes into college, please put them through our sevenmiss.com program where we take the, the top seven false teachings that they're gonna get in a secular college and solidify them and, and, and help them spot what they're gonna be uh, taught in secular college that's gonna go against the conservative Christian faith. Uh, we spend a lot of time fielding questions on our social media channel. We have to ban several people, usually on a daily basis. Of course, we're attacked by hostile atheists. But we get a lot of people that do have genuine questions, and we took the top 50 of those questions that were asked most frequently and developed a book based upon it. If you're a student here tonight, by the way, any of our resources are completely free. We ask everyone else to, to, to pay just 10 bucks for any one of the items, but that book is on the back table there. And uh, here's our YouTube channel, and our top four YouTube videos have to do with Noah's flood, dinosaurs, and the miracles that happened at the crucifixion of, of Christ. Please go watch some of these videos. Um, I became a much more strengthened believer after learning, oh my goodness, there is so much evidence that supports our faith. The Noah's Flood and Catastrophic Plate Tectonics one uh, is approaching three, 3 million views. It's the most watched flood video in the world as far as we're aware. It's not my doing. It was, it was done by researching the top leading flood geologists in the world from the leading creation ministries. We put it together and it really took off on YouTube. And the other ones have to do with, uh, with dinosaurs. 
We have a free mobile app that you can download on your iTunes or Google Play Store. We have over 100,000 installs of that. Uh, and it real, it's just an app that loads up on your phone and it leaks in, links into the leading videos that we have on, on YouTube. We just have done a couple of movies in, in the last year or so. The first one's called Genesis Impact. And this movie features a young creationist gal uh, who's probably college age, and she debates a museum docent from a natural history museum and does so with meekness and competence. And in, throughout that dialogue, you'll see that we take down the top 10 icons of evolution that are on display in natural history museums. So that's a good movie. That's free on our YouTube channel. You can grab a, a DVD and, and back. And then the one that we just came out with is called uh, Foundations Movie. Came out on Good Friday. It's a 23 minute video. It's a drama that shows a young man's life lived under three different worldview scenarios. It shows what, how his life can possibly play out as a creationist or as a compromised Christian, believing some of God's word and not others, or as an atheist, because what we believe about origins really will play out uh, in our life choices and impact. Okay, so tonight we're looking at human evolution, and I want to just start first with what God's word says about uh, the idea of evolution and why people would believe it, because one of the questions we got at the conference is, it's a question I ask myself probably every day, is if creation evidence is so strong, and it is, and evolution evidence is so weak, and it is, why do people still believe it? And the answer is real simple, it's a spiritual phenomenon. Uh, people it, it have to be prayed out of, <laughs> of the uh, idea of believing in evolution, and it takes God to know God. A lot of people who are going to stay in that idea of darkness are living under a lie, and they're not going to learn the truth until the Holy Spirit touches them or leads them a along. Romans 1 uh, would, would agree with that. It talks about this idea, and I want to go ahead and just read the whole passage if you'll, you'll follow with me uh, today. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So if you follow this sequence in Romans, it talks about if you close your mind and your heart to God, you're going to have a darkened understanding that's going to lead to the worship of nature. And that's exactly what happens with this little creature called Shrewdringer. According to evolutionists, this is our grandfather 145 million years back. And it's a four-footed thing, just like this passage talks about. They will exchange the worship of our creator for created things like four-footed animals and creeping things. Well, here's a four-footed animal creeping thing that people worship in an idolatrous way, believing that we came from this little rat-like creature. In fact, if you go to the Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., They've enwrapped this little creature in a throne room. And so you can see they have three big pillars here. You walk in the Natural History Museum, and on the side of it, it says, come in here and meet one of your oldest relatives. In the middle of this little throne room that they've created, they have an altar upon which they place the golden mammal, the little rat that they say humans evolved from. So there is a certain extent of, of worship that's going on here with the darkened mind that has no understanding that instead of going towards the creator, they start worshiping created things. And this is an international phenomenon. This is happening all over the world right now that people attribute uh, humans and the, the fact that we're alive today because this little rat crawled into a three-foot deep hole when the Chicxulub asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs, this little creature dug a hole and went down about three feet deep to avoid extinction. 
That's how the story goes. And it seems ludicrous, but that's what they believe. This is where it's, it's coming from. And I think we all know what Genesis says ab about the creation of man. You know, in short, it says that God, you know, breathed uh, a nefesh, a soul into Adam after creating him out of dust. It was a spontaneous, instant creation. Then he drew Eve from his side. And even Jesus referred back to Genesis twice when he was asked by the Pharisees. And they said, look, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for, for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read speaking of Genesis, that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. So he refers back to Genesis and admonishes these people and said, haven't you read Genesis says that God created man and, and uh, man and woman out of the dust and drew Eve from, from his side. We could also look at Luke chapter 3 where we have over 70 uh, generations that are tied that go straight back from Jesus all the way through the patriarchs, through the pre-flood patriarchs, all the way back to Adam. We have a genealogical record that goes straight back from Jesus to Adam. So if Adam is mythological, Jesus came from a fictional history. So, and if, if Adam is mythological, then Jesus is dying for a myth. We can't have that. Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 are expressly clear that sin, death, and suffering came from the first Adam, and the second Adam, Christ, is our Redeemer who can pull us away from that life of sin and death and, and give, uh, give us salvation. So there's a quick video here that, uh, that shows that point. Without a real Adam, a real garden, a real tree, and a real enemy that led Adam and Eve into sin, the consequences for sin laid out in Genesis 3 has no foundation. And without this, the gospel and the entire New Testament has nothing to stand on. Because of the sin nature we inherited from Adam, we are all in need of a savior. That's the very foundation of the gospel and the New Testament. So there are a lot of Christian movements out, BioLogos and others, that want to fictionalize Adam and say, well, we didn't evolve from, from Adam as a real individual. We came from a population of 10,000 uh, homo sapiens or, or apes that were coming along, cruising that way from ape-like creatures on, onto humans. Uh, but but the, the gospel clearly will not support that. Adam had to be a real individual. And atheists actually uh, recognize this. Here's a quote from a famous... A atheist who said, no Adam and Eve means no need for a savior. It also means that the Bible cannot be trusted as a source of unambiguous literal truth. It is completely unreliable because it all begins with a myth and builds on that as a basis. No fall of man means no need for atonement and no need for a redeemer. So if Adam is mythological and we evolved in the image of apes and not in the image of God, the gospel quickly kind of falls apart there. So let's look at some quick evidence that would actually support the idea uh, that humans are created just from an evidence-based standpoint. So here is a lock and a key. A key goes into a lock and it pushes up the little pins and the springs. And we see here that a key does nothing. A key is worthless. If you find a key out in the parking lot and you don't know what car it goes to, it's just, it's just a waste. And you have a lock set or house that just got a lock, lock system without the key, it's also worthless. So the two of those things have to go hand in hand. They're interdependent. It's the same thing with a car starting system. If you look at the flywheel and you've got a voltage regulator and an alternator and a battery and, and some wires, those five separate components have to be there at the same time from an engineering standpoint for a car to have any function at all. It can't run if you take any one of those five parts aside. Well, did you know that our hearing system is exactly the same? In fact, when I, I speak at secular universities, I challenge evolutionists and I say, if you're open and reasonable, I'll disprove human evolution in just one minute. And I go through the human ear and we, we take a look at it and say, well, you have the, the outside ear, the pinna, which is designed for trapping and capturing sonar waves as I'm pneumatically pushing around air molecules in the, in the room right now. Your outside ear is designed for capturing them. It's kind of a hand and glove thing. So if you were to take your pinna and push it against the end of your, your head here, you're going to lose about 5 or 10% of your hearing. Your ears are designed for capturing speech. 
That goes through a little three inch tunnel that hits your tympanic membrane, your little eardrum that's wiggling around there. And there's a leverage motor that be, that's behind that with the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, these three little tiny bones, each of which about the size of a grain of rice, that actually amplify the pressure being wiggled on your eardrum by a factor of mechanical force of 1.7. So it's upsampled. Then the end of that three bone system is pushing on your cochlea, which is a little snail-like system that's filled with hydraulic fluid with all these hair sensors in it. And when it's pushing on your cochlea, it's upsampled again by a factor of 22 times into a hydraulic machine where the fluid is being pushed around, separating little tiny linking cells that are connected by molecular springs that change a bath solution of potassium and calcium that generate a chemical reaction that is then turned into an electrical reaction that goes through your auditory nerve that's wrapped around a little part in your brain. Five separate systems that had to be engineered, they all had to be present at the same time for the hearing system to work. If you pull out any one of those parts, the whole thing falls apart. Now, I've studied what evolutionists say about this, and you guys, it's really, really weak. They claim that some mammal millions of years ago had a, a lower piece of its jaw that randomly and accidentally got busted off, and then that little piece of a bone eventually found purpose and joined to some other little bones and somehow connected itself to an outside of an ear, to a hyd hydraulic system and a chemical system and an electrical system that makes up hearing. It's miraculous. As I'm sitting here pushing around air molecules, you're hearing it as sound and comprehending it as speech and communication instantly through five systems with zero meaningful data loss. That's miraculous. You can't do this kind of stuff if you take a bucket up on stage and fill it with any kind of protein or DNA or molecules you want and stir it around for five billion years. You're never gonna have five separate systems connect themselves in a way that a holistic purpose from an engineering standpoint comes together. It's just not gonna happen. It would be as ludicrous as saying, you know, your, your key is gonna automatically fit to a lock or your five parts of your car system are gonna just randomly assemble themselves. It takes an engineer. So that's one thing to just look at when it comes to hearing is we've got these sound waves, a mechanical process with these little tiny uh, eardrums here upsampled by 1.7 times and that's bumped up again 22 times more to a chemical electrical system to a chemical system all without meaningful data loss. That system had to be built and designed we could spend a long time talking about DNA. It's just a phenomenal thing. We have a couple of animations and videos here about DNA. But this is, of course, what it looks like. You can pull one molecule of DNA into a six foot long strand, but we're made up of three billion base pairs. And here's just a little snippet about how incredible uh, DNA is. Over 10,000 DNA molecules can fit on the head of a pin, and unfolding just one of them reveals six feet of instructions capable of building who you are. Stretching out DNA in the trillions of cells in your body could reach to the sun and back hundreds of times. So DNA is just not random data, it's organized information. And if people still struggle with the idea of thinking, well, DNA doesn't prove a creator, I challenge them, just go to YouTube and type in Two phrases, DNA replication. And you can look there, there's all kinds of two minute simulations that show this little molecular machine that's inside of our body that's taking this DNA code and it's stripping off the strands and replicating them. It's absolutely a molecular machine and it's just way too uh, fantastic to think that something like that could invent itself. The other evidence that I think lines up uh, truly with the Bible as a, from a creation standpoint is mitochondrial DNA. So here's just a short video that begins that discussion. Evolutionary researchers have based these timelines on the assumption that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor about 5 million years ago. That date was based on counting the mtDNA and protein differences between all the great apes and timing their divergence using dates from fossils of one great ape's ancestor. So to connect the human line to the chimp line or the ape-like ancestor line, 
they would say, well, we need a certain amount of mutations to go from this kind of creature to a human kind of creature. And so we think that probably happened uh, with mitochondrial DNA mutations that happened at a rate of about one mutation every 6,000 years or one mutation every 300 generations. That's theoretically what they were thinking was going to step from us over to chimp-like creatures, ape-like creatures, about 5 million years ago. Then they did an observational study where they actually looked at the observed mitochondrial DNA mutation rate, and it turned out to be much, much faster, in fact, 20 times faster than what they estimated. And that speed of the mitochondrial DNA mutations actually points to mitochondrial Eve, the first woman of us all, being about 6,000 years old, not 200,000 years old like they were hoping. So isn't it interesting here, we have a report from the science journal, a secular journal, saying, yeah, evolutionists are, are most concerned about the effect of a faster mutation rate, which has just recently been discovered. For example, researchers have calculated that mitochondrial Eve, the woman whose mitochondrial DNA was ancestral to that in all living people, lived about 100,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa, but using this new clock, Eve would only be 6,000 years old. Well, we know where we've heard that before, the 6,000 years old. That's how much history we have in the Bible that goes back to Adam and Eve. So what about the idea that we inherited or we, we share 98 to 99% of our DNA with chimps? Has everyone heard of that before, the 98% the idea? So that people frequently have that in quips. It's, 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 it's distributed widely around colleges and high schools. Everyone wants to talk about, oh, human and, and chimps to have 98% of the same DNA. Well, do you know that that is absolutely false? That it's absolutely not correct? It's the same thing with the idea that, oh, we only use 10% of our brain. That's absolutely also not true. And secular evolutionists would stand right here and say the same thing, that the 98% myth thing is incorrect. It's based upon cherry-picked data where they took the three billion base pairs of the human genome after it was, was sampled and done. They took the 3.1 billion base pairs of chimp because they actually have 5% more genetic information than we have. They lined them up and they purposely took the parts that were overlapping and stripped out all the sections that were not the same and threw them out of the study. And when they did that, they had effectively discarded one-fourth of our DNA and 18% of the chimps. And then they compared the rest. So yes, we are 98% the same as chimps if you ignore a quarter of our genome and 18% of theirs. And this isn't some creationist, you know, fundamentalist, we're going to go get them type of uh, journal stuff. This is peer-reviewed science. That this, they're backing off of the study now saying, yeah, we're, we're not really holding to that 98% thing anymore. When you do a more honest comparison, it's about 84% similarities. But we're also very, very similar to a number of other creatures because we're, we're both mammals. Another uh, evidence I find really compelling about humans is blood coagulation. A friend of mine is a number two guy in a leading Northern California medical system. He's also a creationist. And I said, hey, to you, what's the number one proof that God created humans? And he said, that's easy, blood coagulation. When you look at the process of blood clotting and blood coagulation, what stops us from bleeding when we're cut, five processes are put into a chain reaction as soon as we're cut that go into a five-step order, and evolutionists would be really hard-pressed to talk about how that system could have invented itself because you don't, if you don't have all five steps in the same order that they're in now, every creature that didn't have all five steps would have died out when they've gotten any type of a cut. When they start bleeding, they would just bleed right out. But there's five separate steps that have to be done in the order that they are. Otherwise, we, we would just, uh, just bleed right out. So you, you can look at some videos that talk about that. Uh, Ray Comfort also talks about the idea about what evolved first, the heart, blood, or veins. If you think about how evolution might have worked, well, did you did veins come first and then the blood? Well, what, where, where'd you have the heart to pump it around? Or could you have blood without the veins? All those three things had to be there at the same time. 
Okay, now we're gonna get into looking at the, the pile of evidence that they do have for human evolution, and we'll go through and, and talk about that systematically. Or the first part is let's just look at the changing stories and the changing ideas. So if you were to go back and use my grandfather or great-grandfather's book about human evolution, you'd probably get all the authors of the book up here to say as scientists, we know for sure how humans evolved. They were pretty confident about it 100 years ago. They thought they had the lines and the trees. But you know, what do you think happened just a couple decades after that? Well, they changed the tree incredibly. They added some things, took a couple apart. 1931, same thing, and do you know, that all through the three trees you have up right up here on, on the screen, Piltdown Man and Java Man are part of that, which were completely either fraudulent or proven later to be just ape bones. So they're really scrapping together for some ideas. And then the story goes on in 1951, there's still one uh, fake icon th there, if you will. 1965, they change it again. 1985, they change it again, all the way to the future. We now have a human tree, but they're no longer calling that. They're calling it a broken bush of human evolution. And the icons are changing places and changing orders, and some are new and some are kicked out. Um, but all the yellow circles that you see here are question marks that they have up on this tree. And this tree doesn't even agree with the tree from Scientific American. It's completely different. You can see all the breaks they have here in this human evolution tree, which are incomplete linking points between the fossil record. So it's based on a whole lot of inference and a whole lot of guesswork to the point now where they keep publishing journals that journal uh, articles that have titles like this. We've still not found the missing link between us and apes or the human ape missing link is still missing, or things like oldest fossils of our species push back human origin. Again, they're having to add another 100,000 years here to what they think represents the human evolution line. Happy 350,000th birthday. And in San Diego recently, they just found what they thought were 130,000 year old mastodon bones, but there was evidence that humans were there harvesting uh, edible sources from those bones and going, well, that doesn't fit our human evolution lineup at all. Humans were only supposed to be in Americas maybe 10 to 15,000 years ago, but there's evidence that humans were using tools on these animals, what they say, at 130,000 years ago. It seems more fitting that both humans and these creatures were there after the flood, after the Ice Age, just 4,000 years ago. So the next thing we'll look at is the scant and scattered uh, evidence of the fossil record. So one, one would think that if we have 1.5 million primates alive today and over 7 billion humans, there should be a very clear trail of progressing fossil records leading from ape-like creatures over to humans. But that's not what we have. We don't have all of these in-between creatures. In fact, here's a, a quick quote from Dr. Ian Tattersall, who is the director of the American Museum of Natural History, and see what he says about that. About Tattersall, emeritus curator with the American Museum of Natural History, noted that you could fit all the supposed ape to human fossil evidence into the back of a pickup truck if you didn't mind how much you jumbled everything up. With centuries of recorded history and over 7 billion interfertile humans on the planet today, we should certainly have more than a truck bed of fossil evidence if evolution was true. So let's just pick out one of these icons. So if you open up a sixth grade textbook today, they have about 20 pages of teaching that typically covers about two weeks in sixth grade public school, where they make the case to these kids that we evolved from Ardipithecus to Lucy, which is an Australopithecine, uh, and that, that would shift over to Homo habilis, and that would go to Homo erectus, and then finally Homo sapiens. Well, did you know that Homo habilis they haven't found any of those creatures. They have fewer than 100 bone fragments that they put into a taxon that they believe represents this, this imaginary creature called Homo habilis, but they don't have a single one. But I guarantee if you were to survey kids coming out of a sixth grade classroom and ask them, hey, tell me about Homo habilis, they would say, well, the, of course, they, they, I, I, I got to look at Homo habilis. She, she's got eyes and a head and fur on her body, the whole works they would probably think there was all kinds of those creatures found around, but they don't have any. We'll, we'll take a look at that more as we go. 
Uh, but one thing that, that you'll notice when you look, take a tour through the human evolution uh, line, there's a lot of inferences going on. There's a lot of consistent exaggerations and contradictions. So we'll take a look at three of these and just drill in uh, deeply here to, to just three of them. We'll look at Artipithecus, which was discovered in 1992. It took about 17 years to reconstruct her bones which were about 125 pieces, only about half of the skeleton uh, that they found. None of the bones or bone fragments were connected. They found them scattered along the, the dig site there. And it took about 17 years and a whole team to scrap Artie together. Uh, the, the lead discoverer called Artie's bones like mush or roadkill. So this is the type of fossil evidence they're, they're dealing with here. And Artie's claim to fame is that she supposedly walked upright. So they take this, this bone system that they dig up. It's 125 bones. They're not connected. It takes them 17 years to reassemble them. And based upon that data, with the crushed up bones, they say, look at that. Artie walked upright. Let's just objectively go through and look at the evidence that supposedly show that Artie walked upright. They based part of the idea that Artie walked upright based upon her skull, which was squished down to a sandwich of about one and a half inches thick and was reconstructed from about 100 pieces. You can see a skull scan of Artie here. So this is what they're, they're dealing with. Uh, had very, very limited information. And they think that, they sh that she walked upright because of this part of the base of your skull called the foramen magnum. So humans have a spine that goes straight up from, the, from our spine directly into our skull, and it's located about in the middle of our skull so we can turn our heads while we're walking and running. But, but chimps typically have the skull that comes in more near the back of the base of the skull, and it comes in at an angle of about 18 degrees because they're quadrupeds. They're hunched over and they're walking on all fours, but humans are bipedal, so our spine comes straight up and down like this. Well, based upon the skull that you're looking at here, they think that she walked upright because of the hole in her skull. Well, you notice they don't show it here, but you can see part of it right over here. They have about half of the hole of the foramen magnum, and based upon where it's located, they're guessing that she walked upright. That's very, very scant, limited information, it seems like to me. They don't clearly clearly have that. Uh, so, but there, there's a couple other things they think, well, let's talk about Artie's spine. That's another reason that they believe Artie walked upright. Uh, Dr. Lovejoy, he inferred that from the pelvis that her spine was long and curved like a human rather than short and stiff like a chimps. And these changes suggested that Artie uh, was, was bipedal. And uh, so they, they, they took the hip that they couldn't free up from the matrix that it was found in, they digitized it, and then inferred from a little lip on the outside of her hip that she must have had what's called lumbar lordosis, which is a, which is a four part curvature system that only humans have that chimps do not. I'll show you a graphic of that in, in just a minute. But African apes do not have this thing called lordosis or the four curvature curved parts of our spine. And Lovejoy, the discoverer of, of Artie, uh, acknowledged that chimps and gorilla typically have only three or four lower lumbar vertebrae, but he said that Artie had six. But you notice here from the skeleton, they don't have any of Artie's lower lumbar, but he's guessing that she had six. But they're inferring that she had six lower lumbar vertebrae and that her spine that goes up in this space had four curves to it. That's a whole lot of inference. I don't care if you're an evolutionist or a creationist, there's obviously a lot of guesswork going on there. They had no lower lumbar and, uh, and they're making these inferences. So chimps have a one long curve that goes like a shallow C and humans have a four-part curve based upon the cervical curve, the thoracic curve, lumbar and sacral curve. We're much different because we're designed to walk upright. So there's a curve of a human with lordosis, and here is a, a chimp that does not. And here's a quick excerpt from a, a, an arty video showing what she looked like when she walked, and you can just see right through the middle of her. They don't have this information, but they infuse in this video 
uh, not only do they insert a spine that's imaginary, they take the imaginary spine and bend it with four bends to it. The shape of the pelvis confirms that Artie was some kind of early biped. It's now clear that millions of years ago, bipedality did evolve in our African ancestors. So, walking upright must have provided some huge biological advantage for the earliest hominids. Bipedality was a positive that outweighed all the negatives. What advantage did it bring to our early ancestors? Okay, so lots of inference going on there based upon her crushed up hip and her skull that had only half of the hole in which the spine goes up under, no lower spine as well, and they were based all on this based upon a little hip, a little ledge of the hip. So when you line Artie up against a bonobo, which is a chimp, uh, a cousin to a chimpanzee, she looks very, very similar uh, over here, very, very similar to what a bonobo looks like. In fact, you can zoom in on her feet over here. Look at uh, Artie's feet. She has what's called a hallux, which is where we, we have a thumb that comes off of the feet that's a working thumb for grasping in trees, just like a bonobo has. So here's a chimp foot, here's a human foot, and then here is Artipithecus with this thumb that's hanging out to the side. So how in the world could Artie walk when she's got this huge thumb out to the side like that? Would not make for a very efficient walker. And we look at how chimps use their thumbs it's just, it's just amazing. They're, that is actually a foot right there with the thumb coming around grasping on the tree. And they're admitting Artie had that same exact feature called the hallux. So now let's look at the next icon, Lucy. If you were to, we, we teach thousands of sixth graders uh, probably on an annual basis between our videos and in-person stuff. And almost every kid that's gone through sixth grade in public school, you, you ask, raise your hand, does anyone know about Lucy? And they all raise their hand because they've had two weeks training uh, about Lucy. And here is a quick, uh, a quick interview from Dr. Donald Johansson, who's the discoverer of Lucy. And uh, let's just hear what he says about Lucy. And again, this is, this is the next icon. Artie was five to six million years ago. They think Lucy was about three to four million years ago of human evolution. We now have 400 specimens of Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis, named after the Afar region. And uh, we know that there are very large individuals, which were males, and the smaller ones uh, are certainly females. So he said, we now have 400 specimens of Lucy's kind, and then they proceed to show this image of hundreds of complete upright walking skeletons that are marching upon the scene. Well, how many Lucys do you think that they found? Uh, none, actually, just one, and they only found about half of her. And here's what they really mean when they say we now have 400 specimens of Lucy's kind. They're talking about, while they're showing hundreds of complete upright walking skeletons marching across the screen on a parade, what they're referring to actually is a picnic table with not 400, but 380 specimens which are bone pieces, chips, and fragments, and 35% of this collection of 380 bone pieces are just teeth. And the other 20, they believe, are in private collections. So they have 400 specimens, but they have a picnic table of an assemblance of bones from the Hadar region that they believe, they're not sure, but they believe they're of the same type of ape, an Australopithecus afarensis, which means uh, southern ape. So they certainly don't have hundreds of these complete creatures. But when you go to a museum, you always find a complete Lucy with hands and feet. They didn't even find hands or feet on Lucy. And they add eye whites. Have you ever seen an ape that has eye whites? They don't. Some apes have a little bit of a skillery around the side, but apes have completely brown eyes more often than not. But every time you see Lucy in a museum, they put eye whites on her. She's walking upright, and she's got complete hands and feet. In Japan, we had, to, uh, we had to give a bikini here to, to Lucy. They actually took the fur off of Lucy. So now they've, they've given her a boyfriend and a kid, and, and she's walking along without any, any fur on her at all. Lucy with eye whites, Lucy in deep thought. Now she's a philosopher, you know, so it's really, really exaggerated. And when you look at the fossil record itself on just Lucy, yeah, they found some other Australopithecines, but if you look at just, just Lucy, they found her main bones are scattered over about a nine-foot area, 
but they, just to make sure they got the whole thing, they, they screened 50 square meters or 20 tons of dirt to make sure that they found as much as they could of Lucy, and, and it represented only 20% of her bones, and at least one of those bones we now know didn't belong to Lucy's kind at all. It belonged, her, her thoracic vertebrae belonged to an extinct gibbon. So it makes you think, my gosh, if you screen, you screen 20 tons of dirt over a 50 meter area, you only get 20% of the bones of this creature, and one of them didn't even belong to her, how reliable is what you have of this creature? So certainly not very good uh, dependable information. Homo habilis is the next one in the lineup, are called handyman. They believe that this creature was using tools. Well, if you look at the region in which Homo habilis bones were found, and this is the type set of bones, this is the best representation of this creature that they have, which represents a total of 17 bone fragments, but the whole taxon is represented by only 100 bone chips and fragments, but they think they want to say that this creature was now starting to stand upright and was starting to use stone tools. Well, if you look at the stone tools that were found in the region where they found Homo habilis bones, they were quarried a couple miles away from a certain type of quartz, and they were all hammer flaked with percussion flaking in ways just like the Native Americans were doing here a couple hundred years ago, right here in California, using, with very, very precise tools. The and evidence they, that human- And they found a, a 12 foot circular hut structure, a foundation of a hut structure where they found all the bones, 95% of the animal bones, like catfish, cows, and other creatures that were found that, that were scattered outside of this hut structure. It had six different pillars that were on it where they would bend over the branches for making like a hut formation. And they found the debitage for the stone tools, which is the discards after they make the stone tools, also outside the hut foundation. And they found the homo habilis bones in a strata higher than the hut foundation. Well, what does that tell you? You can't have the creature with the bones evolving after someone was there building a stone hut foundation. It's completely backwards to what evolution uh, would have. And, uh, and I want to show you just a couple more pieces about that. So here, there are actually people in the same region building, building these types of huts today. Uh, people in, in, in the Americas and other places are still building these types of huts. So, but when you go ask a kid who just got indoctrinated in sixth grade school about Homo habilis, I guarantee none of them know that the Homo habilis is represented by a little tiny sand bucket's worth of, 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 of fossils, less than 100 fossil pieces, and that they found the, 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 the bones of this creature above a stone hut foundation that the founder, Mary Leakey, says was built by humans. It makes no sense at all. So there goes that icon. The next one in the lineup is Neanderthals. Uh, when I was a student in school, when my dad was a student in school, when my grandpa was a student, there was Neanderthals there, and they were portrayed like this 1909 picture here from London News as a brutish beast going around with clubs, you know, beating things and then dragging them back to, to their caves. So that's what Neanderthals were back then. But now that we've done more studies of Neanderthals, we found them buried and having families with people that we would refer to as Homo sapiens because Neanderthals were humans. They're, they're, they're very, very similar to the, the body phenotype that we would have today. They're no more different than I might be from, from a Polynesian person. They were very stocky build, kind of husky, bigger heads, a little bit bigger heads than, than humans have today. They found them made with, uh, buried with instruments, weapons, burying their dead ceremonially. And even they, they've now learned that they were using shells from a certain depth of the ocean as tools for scraping meat off of uh, the animals that they killed. So people admit now, and yes, Neanderthals were just humans. Uh, but before, they used to be these brutish beasts. So there we have it, that's the whole lineup. If you go, this is an extract from a, a sixth grade school textbook. They've got Artie and Lucy's kind, Homo habilis's kind, Homo erectus, and then Homo sapiens. And then another thing I found real interesting when in there, of course, the skeleton we talked about, this Artie and then and Lucy and then the Homo habilis kind. But do you know that if you ask evolutionists, we, of course, we don't agree with their timeline of going back five million years with all this dating that, that they do. 
um, that they would say that the time period between two and three million years, just one-fifth of the entire time that they say we evolved from ape-like creatures to human, that they say that they have almost no fossil records whatsoever in that entire one million year period from two million years ago to three million years ago, and again, we don't, we don't believe those, those time frames, that you could take all of the evidence that humans evolved from apes and put it into a shoe box and still have room to put the shoes back in. So very, very, very scant uh, evidence that, that we're dealing with here. Okay, so that is uh, bringing us to a rapid conclusion of a very quick tour through the idea of, of human evolution. But I want to see if I can take uh, some, some questions now so we can close up on, on time. Any questions? I know we covered a lot of stuff and it was super fast, but I wanted to make sure we, we got through it all. Any questions about this? You look kind of shell-shocked. Maybe I went too fast. <laughs> so I'm pretty passionate about this stuff, so we, we do cover a lot of grounds. But you know, let me just say this. It's interesting. Um, if you interview kids that go to sixth grade, my, my son went to sixth grade, and one of the reasons, a sixth grade public school, and one of the reasons I pulled him out is I went to his back-to-school night when we were just starting to form our ministry, and the teacher said in the world history class, she said, well, look, we're going to cover human evolution in this class, or if you're Catholic or Christian or, or, or Jewish, don't worry about it. We just have about two weeks worth of it in class, and we move on to other stuff. And when she said that, I remember looking at her bookshelf, and she had all these books on evolution, and then she had up on her counter there uh, a gallon container and a quart container and a pite size container filled with popcorn corns. And I remember my son telling me, yeah, that's what she uses to talk about the cranial capacity of apes as we, we led on over to humans. And my son says, Dad, all of the Christians that I know just sat in class and they're with their heads down and their pencils in hand and they're being formatted like a hard drive. No one was questioning anything. They would have to go home and make dioramas about, evolu about humans evolving from apes and imagine what they were eating, and they had to do reports. I mean, it was really grilled into their minds. It took me a, a while to be able to unwind that stuff for my, for my son. And my son was not raised as an evolutionist at all. He, was, he believed in, in creation, but they present some pretty compelling stuff. But when you take each one of these icons and flip them around to say, well, what do you mean by this creature? As we've reviewed tonight, even, I think evo even evolutionists would admit to say, yeah, there's a lot of guesswork going on, a lot, lot of guesswork. So important stuff. Yes, question. Yeah. Any kind of book or, uh, that I can buy that can sit down and, 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 and uh, that would have this kind of information, a children's type book that would. Uh, that is a great question. And first, I would say, just from a strategy standpoint, you're absolutely right. We, it would be a great idea to sit down with kids and to say, here is Lucy. They did find some bones out in Hadar. It's probably an extinct ape. And look at that. Isn't it interesting how you can have the same data, the same bones? And if you look at it through an evolutionist, you're going to come with one conclusion. But if you look at it through the lens of a creationist, you're going to have another conclusion. So it's good to talk them through it. But our program called debunkevolution.com is great for 5th to 10th graders. But I would say normally you want to start teaching them this stuff when they're, when they're 9 or 10. It's probably a, a good age. And I encourage people to take, take the kids through, through uh, museums and talk them through the evidence. I mean... Christians don't want to be like ostriches with their head in the sand. Go through, look at the evidence, but view it through a worldview lens of creation. It actually makes a whole lot more sense when you do that. So, uh, good. Yes? Where did they get the evidence for saying that they were upright walking? Do they actually like, look at the bones and say that, or are they just making it up? So, they, they are trying... Uh, to do that with each one of the icons that we showed. Now, Homo habilis, they don't have enough information to talk about her locomotion. But with Lucy, 
They claim that she walked upright for, from, for some features that were very similar to Artie. They, like Artie, they looked at a little bump on the hip, and they looked at her frame and magnum and everything, and they looked at, you know, they inferred what her, fi her spine must have looked like. But I find it very ironic that CNN, for example, uh, highlighted a story that they just did on Lucy a couple of years ago. It was on CNN and went all over the news. There was a team of scientists from a University of uh, Texas that went back and revisited and looked at Lucy's bones and determined that she fell out of a tree about 40 feet high while traveling 35 miles an hour and tried to brace her fall while she was still alive because her wrist and her forearms and her hip have what's called green stick fractures, which is where you take a, like a green stick and bend it until it snaps and then it splinters. Well, they noticed that her bones had green stick fractures on it. And, that, and that's very, very ironic because the, find, the founders of Lucy said, no, she's walking around on the ground just like humans. So that begs the question, what is your upright walking bipedal ape doing 40 feet up in a tree you know, where she falls? So yeah, they, they do try to infer you know, evidence to try to show that they're walking upright. And even chimps today can walk a little, little bit uh, upright, maybe 10, 20, 30 feet, but it looks really awkward when they do it. So. It's, it certainly would. It would really interfere with it, but they just turn, the, they rotate their hips outward like this and kind of waddle. So it's clear, they can't, they definitely can't run and they can't do it for a long time. You can go to YouTube and find a couple clips of chimps walking upright and you just go, man, that's just really awkward looking. So they're clearly designed to be uh, tree dwelling creatures. So good questions. Yes, uh, in the back, ma'am. That's 100% um, artistic license. They don't have any ground. Soft tissue is gone uh, from, from these creatures. All they have is bones, and, uh, and they can't infer, they can't extract the DNA, or they haven't, haven't tried. They can't extract anything about fur, hair color, uh, anything of that, that nature. So it's all artistic license. They take the skeletal structure, they give it to a team that puts a bunch of Play-Doh on it, and then they give it to an artist that will, that will paint up what they think it looks like. So it's, it's all guesswork. That's a great question. There was another question there? Yeah. I, I did have a question. I'm not even sure how to form it, but when you talked about the evolutionary trees, and you went pretty quickly in how they changed and on. Yeah. Um, and, and were you talking about the base of all of those evolutionary trees that there's absolutely no, there's no evidence of any kind of uh, transitional or uh, fossil on any of the trees ever? Well, the creationist position would be, yes, that there are no transitions between ape-like creatures and humans, of course. But they, they, they do have fossils. They have extinct ape fossils, or they have mixed taxons that are sometimes some human fossils and some, some apes. So they do have the bones. So they, they do have patchy guesswork that they do put, put together. I think the point of that slide is to show that it shuffles around and changes a lot. And it has also historically included some fraudulent icons. When you go back and particularly look at the older ones, there was about a 50-year period from 1900s to 1950s where Java Man and Piltdown Man were right there with the rest of them carrying the day. There's books written about Piltdown Man, which, is, which was shown, shown to be a complete forgery. So it's very interesting how it, how it ships around. Also, one little quick question. We've learned over the last couple days that they found uh, um, remains of a dinosaur that was about 's I, I would say that I'm not aware of any study that's that's done that it would be fascinating to be able to take Lucy's bones uh, and be able to, to, to submit that to them to that type of analysis but when we're dealing with ice age creatures like Lucy or dinosaur age creatures which were flood which is a couple hundred years back 
you really do have to get into environments and conditions where the bone won't permineralize and typically like the Lizcombe bone bud up in Alaska where it's frozen in this tuft and, or in, in tundra and the Hell Creek formation where it's really, you know, they're, they're compressed in this silty fine sediment or in places like Madagascar, you have to find places like that where we do get bone pres good bone preservation. But you look at the arid areas where these creatures are being found like Artie, uh, and Lucy, they're probably pretty hard and pretty permineralized bones, and I, I don't know if they've ever been subjected to soft tissue analysis. Yeah. Good questions. Yes. Um, yeah, I loved your examples about the, the hearing and the DNA, and mm. I was just wondering if there are any other ones like that. Yes, there, there certainly is. I, I think for me, the, the unstoppable proof of, of, of humans being created is the eye. It's not, the, it's not even the ear. The ear is just real simple to go through, through quick. But what did it for me as far as being uh, very convincing is, uh, what is it called, the zonar apparatus? When you look at our lens inside of our eye, it looks like a trampoline with a bunch of springs around the circle. And as we squint, we can actually bring things into focus. But if you look at the muscle and those zonar, the, the fibers that pull our lens to make it focus and then relax to make it contract, and just the fact that we can focus on something that's this close and then instantly look at something else 100 feet away and focus, and that's because these little tiny filament fibers are pulling a lens like springs on a trampoline. It's unbelievable. It's just uh, it's such a convincing proof of a creator. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay, I guess we'll wrap it up. It's about 8 o'clock. Thank you very much. I'll be in the back, uh, and I'm going to trek it home tonight to Sacramento. I'll make it back by midnight, I think. I think this was my 10th talk to, uh, over the last three days, so thank you very much for being patient with me and let me rip through this one. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Okay. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Biddle. <laughs> forgot sure. that. Anyway, uh, he's unique in a way because if you look at Anderson Genesis or ICR, he's the only one that's based in Northern California. That's true. So pray That's for true. him. Because I speak Californian. See, yeah. So, yeah. As he tries to minister to, he's speaking to the choir here, of course, right? <laughs> yeah. But pray that God opens doors so he can reach out to Christian school students mm. because I pray for my grandkids now. Used to be my kids. Pray for them too. But they're facing a whole different culture. So we need to base what we have on God's word, but then the science is behind it. Great point. And I just yeah. so appreciate that, and I so appreciate the, and uh, of course they find most of their stuff on an iPad or a phone. So avail yourself of that, and your grandkids of that, and your kids of that, and uh, and uh, we will pray for your ministry. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So, hey, I appreciate it. And he's hey. got tapes in the back or DVDs. Yes, yes. Yeah, so some tapes and books, stuff. and it's all free to, to students here. If you're a student okay. here tonight, it's grab it free, so okay. thank you. Okay, thank you for that. All right. Uh, if you're around Sunday here, 9.30 a.m., 10.45 and 6 p.m. here, David Gunn is here. Some of you knew David Gunn was, he was pretty small, but uh, he's going to talk about pre-millennialism, pre originalism, and uh, God's prophetic calendar for the Gentiles. So if you don't know what originalism, come and see, and premillennialism. So we have Alpha and Omega, right? Tonight we got the Alpha, Sunday we get the Omega part of it. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the time we've had together. Lord, it's just so much to take in all at once. And of course, with your spirit's uh, conviction, and we believe your word, we trust in it, but we need to be able to share that with those around us. We need to be able to uh, uh, share God's truth in creation with those around us. And in our culture, they need that truth because then they can trust the Christ who redeemed them and the God who created them. Bless our time now, guide us safely home, uh, guide Dan safely home and thank you for his ministry. May it multiply 
and reach many with the truth. Guide our steps in Christ's name, amen. It's an offering plate and back, so whatever you put in there goes to Chasta Bible College for the conference. Thank you.